I was born in the city of Detroit, Michigan in the late 50s. I was one of the Sandlot generation raised by free range parents who on summer mornings would kick us out of the house so that we could go off into the neighborhood and explore and have adventures and play with our friends only to be called home at the end of the day for supper. Now at an early age, I was attracted to all the natural areas. And even though I was being raised in an urban neighborhood, I was always on the lookout for the fields and the woodlots and the ponds. I would come home with buckets of pollywogs hoping to hatch them into frogs and take my watercolor paints out to fields where wildflowers were blooming so that I could capture them with my paints and bring them home and post them up on my bedroom wall. At the age of 12, I was lucky enough to go to camp. And that camp took us on canoe trips up into the north woods of Michigan, where I first felt that sense of home in the north woods. When I went to college, I went to the University of Michigan, the School of Natural Resources. And two years into college, we had to spend our spring semester at an outpost camp in the Upper Peninsula where we studied fish and bugs and wildlife. And during that semester at that bug camp, I first learned about a place called Isle Royal a beautiful pristine island just north and west of the Keweenaw Peninsula of Michigan, but closer to the Minnesota border. That summer we learned about the delicate balance between the wolf and the moose population on Isle Royal and how those populations started to dance together as long ago as 1948. They believed that when the ice formed between the mainland and the island, some of the wolves from the mainland came out to that island and made it their home. Thus started that balance, that dance between the moose population and the wolf population, which has changed over the years and been managed in many different ways. I knew when we studied that island that one day I had to go there. Now, when I became a storyteller and I started to study all the stories from different cultures, it wasn't long before I realized that there were many cultures who had stories about a mythological wolf type creature. In some of those stories, the wolf was a protector, but in most of those stories, <laughs> wolves were evil and something to be feared. I thought back to the stories of my childhood, the ones like Little Red Riding Hood and the Three Little Pigs and a song that we sang that said, who's afraid of the big bad wolf? And I thought about those stories and what they did to the idea of wolves. And then I thought about the wolves living in the wilds of Isle Royal and how different those stories felt. Well, during the summers of 1997 through 2004, I was lucky enough to be one of the touring artists that was chosen to be a part of something called Michigan's Great Outdoor Culture Tour that was hosted by the Michigan Humanities Council. During those summers, the goal was to send artists who were singers and dancers and historical interpreters and storytellers to the northern part of Michigan and the Upper Peninsula to perform at places like state parks, national forest campgrounds, lighthouses, and historic sites. Our goal was to bring a bit of Michigan history and culture to the people who were on vacation so that it would enrich the tourist experience. Well, during those years, I had the pleasure of performing at many wonderful places in Michigan, like the Pictured Rocks National Shoreline, or the Bubbling Springs of Kichitekipi, and Fayette, a historical mining town. 
iron smithing town. But my favorite place to have been scheduled during all of those years and a dream come true was the year that I was scheduled to perform on Isle Royal. It was the first of many visits to that island on the culture tour. During those days, if you were an artist on the culture tour, you would perform on a boat called the Ranger that left Houghton, Michigan and made a four hour journey over to Rock Harbor on Isle Royal. Then we would perform in the lodge that night and on the way back to the mainland, give another performance. Well, over the years, I got to know the Rangers really well. And whenever I was scheduled on Isle Royal, why I would connect with the Ranger, the head Ranger, his name was Greg Blust. He knew how much I loved that island. And I always built in extra days so that I could go off into the wilderness and hike and camp by myself. Greg Blust would always get me a backcountry permit and then he would reserve one of the shelters in Rock Harbor for me so that I could leave the next morning on my adventure. Well, one year I was scheduled on Isle Royal and I told stories on the boat all the way over. That night, I told stories about Michigan in the lodge and there were many people in the audience that night who had just arrived on the island that day and others who had just come in from several days of their experience of hiking. So I was not the only storyteller that night. There were stories about moose sightings and sightings of fox and wolf howls. Well, after my performance in the lodge that night, I went to sleep in my small shelter in Rock Harbor, feeling excited about my adventure. You see, I had planned a full week of hiking and camping by myself on the island. The next morning I woke early, I packed up my backpack and I headed out with the suggestions from Ranger Blust you see, most of the people would arrive from the boat on the island in the late afternoon, and they would all hightail it down the trail to the closest campsite, which was Daisy Farm. That made it hard to get a sight, but Ranger Blust had told me how to navigate that island. And so that morning, I headed out on a trail that went up and up and up four miles to the Greenstone Ridge that runs along the top of that island, and then spent the rest of the day hiking down the other side to a beautiful campsite by the name of Lane Cove. And as luck would have it, I was the only one camping in Lane Cove that night. It's a beautiful campsite nestled in a small harbor on Lake Superior, and it's protected by a point that sticks out in front of that campsite to block the wind. That night, I set up my camp and I went for a swim and I cooked soup for dinner and I watched a beautiful sunset on Lake Superior. And then there came that beautiful golden glow after the sunset that you only see in the North Woods on nights like that. At dusk, I went down to the edge of the water to wash up my dinner dishes. There was still enough light to see that point silhouetted in front of me, when all of a sudden, the silence was broken by a very long and melodic wolf howl. I felt myself suck breath in, but I didn't let it out. I felt all the hairs on the back of my neck prickle. I sat waiting, wondering what was gonna come next when behind me, there came an answer, a howl from a younger wolf that sounded very young and unpracticed. I thought, is that the mother talking to the baby? I didn't have to wait long to get the answer. For in front of me, they, there came another long, beautiful howl, and then everything went silent. 
I couldn't believe what I had experienced that night. I almost hoped that there had been somebody there camping with me so that I could say, did you just hear that? Did you hear the wolves? That night I laid down in my tent, thinking about that mother wolf and that baby, hoping that they found each other in the woods that night. And I thought back to those days when I was young, wandering the neighborhood, having my own adventures. And when it got dark out, I would hear my mother call my name out the back door, Jen, it's time for supper. And I would answer her, I'll be there soon. And I just wondered if what I heard that night was just wolf dialogue between a parent and a baby. And all that parent was saying was that it was time to come on home. <laughs>